Welcome to the spiritual forum, everyone. So glad you're here. It's a beautiful day where I am and no matter what the weather is, I'm sure it's a beautiful day where you are as well. I'm here to bring a message of hope, a message to help you with your spiritual journey and a message of awakening. And today we're gonna to do a lot of awakening with, our, with my new guest and I think you're going to really enjoy it. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Before I introduce him, I remind you to please leave a positive rating and review on the Spirit to Form podcast. I'm on YouTube now and I'm getting a YouTube following. I'm kind of surprised at that, but I am on YouTube if you prefer to do that. The Spiritual Forum is on YouTube. And don't forget, I am hosting a Whole Planet Spirituality Forum and Retreat at Unity Village this October, which is next month. And you can find out all about that at thespiritualforum.org slash retreat. Now, let me introduce to you Mark Gober. Mark is the author of An End to Upside Down Thinking, which was awarded the Independent Publisher Book Award for Best Science Book in 2019. He's also the author of An End to Upside Down Living, An End to Upside Down Liberty, and An End to Upside Down Contact. And he's the host of a podcast, Where Is My Mind? I think that's a really intriguing name for a podcast, Where Is My Mind? Additionally, Mark serves on the board of the Institute of Noetic Sciences and the School of Wholeness and Enlightenment. Previously, Gober was a partner at Sherpa Technology Group in Silicon Valley, and he worked as an investment banking analyst with UBS in New York. He's been named one of IAM Strategy 300, the world's leading intellectual property strategist. Today, I'm going to be talking with Mark about his first book, an end to upside down thinking. And I plan to have him kind of come back to talk to us about it into upside down liberty and, and maybe the others as well. But today we're going to focus on that one. And I think they're all going to kind of intertwine. Um, welcome, Mark. So glad you're here with me today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we had a, a little pre conversation, you know, before this, this podcast conversation to, to kind of discern what, what we want to talk about. And I, I got all your books and I've read a, not all of it, but a good deal of into upside down thinking. And I've been in this place in my own awareness, my own consciousness that, that I'm living in a completely upside down world. Like, like so many of the paradigms that I have been living with, like, you know, just indoctrinated and just accepted, I think they're all upside down. And it's a just a really interesting place to be, to really inquire about, do we have this right? Do we have this right? Because many times in history, we haven't. So before, before I keep talking too much, I, I want like for you to share, you know, what is your journey, your spiritual journey? And then we'll get to talk about what is this upside down thinking all about? Okay. Well, my journey started off in a manner that uh, did not seem spiritual, <laughs> and I didn't foresee anything spiritual to be happening. Um, growing up, I was always very focused on achievements, and I was a competitive tennis player, so I was traveling around the country to play tournaments, and I was very focused on grades and social life, um, and I didn't have a sense of meaning or purpose behind that. I just had the next thing that was this big challenge that I wanted to overcome. And that continued for me in college. I went to Princeton and I was uh, on the tennis team there. So that as a division one program kept me very busy. And then the academics and all the social stuff too, was very busy and was so focused on, on what I had to do next that I, I wasn't thinking about existence. Although I will say I was uh, considering majors when I was a sophomore at Princeton and I started off in the economics department, which I wasn't loving because it felt really theoretical. And I had taken a course on astrophysics and just loved it. I thought it was so fascinating to think about our place in the universe. So there was part of me that, that was pulling in that direction even back then. And probably even before that, I, I think I was, I had questions about the universe, but never fully explored it. And ultimately I decided not to major in astrophysics because of my tennis commitments. And I was going to have to, take a bunch of classes that were really hard and catch up. And I wanted to, I, I, I was not prepared to drop my grades over all this. So I said, I'm, I'm not gonna do astrophysics. This isn't realistic for me to do. So I ended up majoring in psychology where I wrote my thesis on a hybrid of psychology and economics. Um, so in some ways I was, I was thinking about deeper issues of human behavior, but not, nothing in a spiritual direction. And as I got older and progressed through college, I went into investment banking after Princeton. Um, I worked in New York 
during the crisis. I graduated in 2008. So I was there from 2008 to 2010. There was no time to think about anything during that period other than just get the work done that's being demanded of me. I barely slept. And then I left in 2010 to join a firm where I spent 10 years. I eventually became a partner, first in the Boston office, and then most of my time was in Silicon Valley. And I worked really, really hard in that job. But for a period at the beginning of the new job, I had a little bit more time on my hands and I started reading, but it was mostly some psychology, but I read like Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, which was basically saying that all, all religion is, is superstition. And I just love the arguments he made for it. And so I was becoming more and more atheistic or agnostic as I was progressing. It, it's very difficult to live that way <laughs> for a long period of time, especially when enduring the ups and downs of life. And it became more difficult to handle them. And I also started to realize that I was living on a treadmill. Because after all this time of trying to achieve something, and many times I would achieve it, and sometimes I wouldn't, but even if I did achieve it, I went to this baseline level of happiness. And in psychology, it's called the hedonic treadmill. It's a phenomenon where you return to this baseline level of happiness. So the, 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 the spike in happiness was temporary when I would achieve something, and it, it started to become more dull over time. And then if you combine that with some personal struggles that started to emerge, like 2014, 2015, some business deals that I spent a lot of time on, didn't go the way that I wanted, some things in my personal life, like dating, and then in the back of my mind, thinking life was meaningless. That's where I was. Life is random and meaningless. When you die, that's it. And to think otherwise would just be trying to rationalize something that, that's not real. Uh, so I was not in a good place by that point, around 2016. I, I was not looking for anything new, to be very clear. I was not looking for a spiritual path, at least explicitly. But I started listening to podcasts at that time. I heard some podcasts in the business world, like some the Tim Ferriss show. He was interviewing venture capitalists. And that was interesting to be able to hear people talk for a long period of time. That was a new, newer thing back then. And, and then I started to listen to some alternative health shows. Um, I heard about phenomena like uh, sensory deprivation, flotation tanks. So I started to do some floats in the tanks in San Francisco where I lived, and it was basically a form of meditation. And I said, wow, this is a cool way to, to, to try to calm the mind because I was hearing about all the positive benefits of things like it or even psychedelics, which I was not doing. But to do a, a sensory deprivation technique, that might be a way to have some similar benefits. So I was becoming interested in that sort of thing in the summer of 2016. And then I heard a podcast episode on Extreme Health Radio a woman talking about psychic abilities. Her name's Laura Powers. Um, she's now a friend and I've been on her podcast and she was on my podcast. Uh, but at the time it didn't change my life. It was just interesting for me to hear a person talk about communications with other dimensions, angels, working with clients with her psychic abilities and seeing energy, that sort of thing. And at the end of the show, Laura mentioned that she has her own podcast called Healing Powers. And at the time I was listening to podcasts, I would drive from San Francisco to Silicon Valley, lots of traffic. So I had a lot of podcast time where I couldn't work, even though I typically wanted to work. I, I couldn't in that period when I was in the car. So I just, I subscribed to her podcast and the episodes are pretty short. So I ended up listening to all of the episodes on her show from 2016 back to 2011 when the show started within a matter of weeks. And what intrigued me so much about her show was that there were people from independent uh, backgrounds who were not connected to each other that were describing a picture of reality that was totally not aligned with what I thought was real. So I had to try to reconcile that with my worldview. Are these people all lying? Are they somehow colluding with each other, which didn't seem realistic? Or is there some truth to this? beyond just delusion. Uh, so then I started to read books and I got more serious about it. I looked at some scientific papers around it. Um, and when I say it, I mean the idea that there's more to life than a random meaningless universe, that there's a spiritual dimension that our eyes can't see. That was the general theme of what I was looking at. Uh, pretty quickly, like probably within a few weeks, but definitely within a few months, I knew that, that I was wrong my old worldview was wrong. Wow. And that was jarring because I didn't know what to do. I didn't have friends that thought about these topics. I didn't know there were spiritual communities or, or that many podcasts out there. 
So I felt pretty isolated at the time socially, but I started to engage with healers, psychics. I wanted to test things out for myself. And they, a lot of those people were able to at least steer me because they were much more familiar with the space. And they were sometimes able to do things that I could not explain psychically or otherwise. And that was just validating a lot of what I had researched. And then I started to have crazy synchronicities that uh, it's always hard to talk about synchronicities because they're so personal. Um, it's hard to know for someone else to know what's happening in your life and why something is so crazy, but certain words appearing over and over again in weird places to the point that I was writing them down in my, in my notes in my phone because they were so outrageous. And I was trying to do the math in my head of like, could this be random? So it was like this confluence of events. And I, I didn't know what to do at that time because I was already pretty feeling pretty lost in life. And now my worldview was totally changed. What do I do? And where I went and it seems to still be in that, on that path is I wanted to learn more. So I just kept researching. And then eventually I started to talk to some friends about it over dinner or just conversations catching up. And I would tell them about some of the studies, the scientific studies that I was learning about. And sometimes people would come back to me after the conversation and say, Mark, I'm still thinking about what we talked about. That's crazy. I can't believe there's evidence for these sorts of things. I need to look into it. But many times people are busy in their lives and they just go on with every other things and maybe drop it. But what I learned from that is that the, this information is not only impactful for me, but it can be impactful for other people. So fast forward to the next summer, summer of 2017, I, I have a vague memory of what happened is that I was about to drive to work one day and I was like, maybe I should summarize all the stuff that I've been researching into a book. And then I said, I shouldn't do that. I'm working, I'm <laughs> trying to make partner at the firm. I want to have a long-term career. I can't write about psychic abilities and people surviving bodily death and you know, the continuation of consciousness. That's too crazy. But that was a very short-lived thought. I, I erased that quickly and then said, no, this is really important. I've got it. This, I should do this. So the 4th of July weekend in 2017 was a long weekend. And I had friends, they were all partying, doing different things. And I said, I'm going to sit in my apartment and become an investment banker and write this whole book as much as I can. So I barely slept for that long weekend, but I got a big chunk of the book done. Wow. Like more than half of it. And then at that point, I knew what I had to do to finish it because I had the whole outline. So then over the next few weekends, it was done, at least the first draft of it. And then it was revised somewhat, but that was basically the book. So there I was, all of a sudden, I have a book that okay. talks about crazy things. And I'll stop there. Yeah, I just want you to pa just pause. I don't want you to stop, but I need you to pause because there's a lot in what you just said. First of all, I think that what you when you talked about your life in high school, college, mostly college, early adulthood, that you you were thinking about the next thing and you weren't thinking about existence. <laughs> I think how, you know, don't you see that all over the place? People just walking around, you can just see it. they're not thinking about existence. And, and, and even, even being able to reflect on, I'm not thinking about existence is, is kind of a little awakening. Like I wasn't thinking about existence. I'm not thinking about existence. I think that's really fascinating that you, looking back, you can see that. Then, then you talked about being, going the agnostic atheist route and how that was not working for you. And I always think that I always think that because I must use the word God, source, universe, whatever anybody wants to call it, that we have these we have these challenges that that we're 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 just, we're just slammed against the wall sometime because not having any grounding in spirituality is kind of a miserable existence. It's like how do you how do you live through those times? And you seem extremely reflective at that time that that you could see that you know being on the treadmill and that that your path the agnostic was and all the ups and downs that made it more and more difficult to handle um, because this idea that life is meaningless it's like there's no grounding <laughs> there's no grounding but I, but I also completely get that from a scientific standpoint point of view from a, a left brain point of view and we see a lot of scientists and um oh gosh what was the name of the guy i can't remember his name but there are few that have come out and said exactly what you said that it's just it's life is just life and anything beyond that you're just fooling yourself you're making it up it's a santa claus it's a fantasy and i'm not going to do that so i'm going to hold on to my life is meaningless <laughs> i'm going to hold on to that worldview, and and 
it's not a fantasy, what you find out in your book and all of your research, it's not a fantasy, that it is a reality that we just don't see. I want to really, 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 really commend you for when you started seeing a picture of reality that was different than yours, that rather than reject it outright, you asked the big question, is this truth? You know, is, is, my, is my sense of reality true? Is that, is that sense of reality, does it have any truth in it? Because I think that we're seeing now, I think we've always seen, but now people are just really digging their heels in and not able to, not being willing, not they are able, not being willing to ask that question. Is this true? Is this way I look at the world that I've always looked at the world that I inherited from my parents, that they inherited from their parents, is it true? Because to your, then your next statement was, I knew that my old, my, my old view was wrong. I mean, how many people can do that? You know, how many people can say, I knew I was wrong, and then go into this completely different avenue to, to investigate? Because you're a really, really, really smart guy, and you, you're, you're able to kind of let your ego loose and pursue a new adventure. And I think that's just fabulous. Thank you. And I thank you for highlighting those points for the audience because I'm so used to it that sometimes uh, I don't even reflect on those little issues yeah. anymore. Like when you said that I wasn't thinking about existence, that just based on the network of people that I know, to ask that question, to have a conversation of, wait, why do you think you exist? Do you think there's any meaning built into the nature of reality itself? People might be like, what are you talking about? That's like, you know, let's let's focus on the next business deal we're working on because it's it's so fundamental that it's often overlooked and like you say just to reflect on that question is a part of an awakening can be it's part huge. of an awakening yeah it's huge and yeah how many people who are they're on the hamster wheel they're you know the grind they're doing their work they're raising their kids they're doing everything and and just just pause and go what is reality <laughs> What yeah. is existence? What what is meaningful? And and these are the questions that that I think just really open up our consciousness, our awareness to to obviously the path that you are on, the spiritual path, that this new path. Yes, and and also with regard to my my worldview flip, if I deconstruct what happened, and this still continues to happen today. I mean, today we're going to talk about one par paradigm primarily, but I've had multiple paradigm shifts right. and probably will have more. But I I could not discount everything that I heard. So all of a sudden I had this new evidence base that existed, which previously was invisible to me. And now it was there. And it was a back and forth process where I might take two steps forward because I'd hear really interesting evidence that was very powerful to me. And then I'd be like, ah, come on that's not real. Or I would be busy with work and then I wouldn't listen to quite as many podcasts or something. And then I'd read a book about something and then I'd move forward a few steps. So it was not a linear process. It was back and forth, but there was maybe a tipping point or maybe multiple tipping points that really hit me hard where it was the combination of all the evidence I had heard, plus something that really hit home. So I'll give one example. And I, I think this was in maybe September of 2016. So Within a few weeks of, of having heard that initial podcast, um, I, th this was a show on Laura Powers' podcast, Healing Powers, with uh, an interview with Paul Davids, who I interviewed on my podcast too. He's uh, He wrote a book called uh, An Atheist in Heaven, but his he's well known for being a Hollywood producer. He produced the Transformers. He also went to Princeton and is a psychology major like me. So I heard him talking after I'd heard all these other interviews, and he was talking about how, how he had a, a colleague in the Hollywood business who was an atheist, but said, look, if I die, because he was older than Paul, if I die first and there is an afterlife, I'll drop you a line, even though I don't think that's gonna happen. So he died, uh, Paul's colleague, and then crazy things started to happen. And his book, An Atheist in Heaven, goes through the anecdotes of the crazy things. One of which, I just remember how shocking it was when I heard it, was uh, he was home alone and was looking at papers and left the room and came back and there was an ink blot on the text of one of the pages that he was looking at. And the words that were crossed out had meaning related to the person that had been to see that passed away. So he had the ink blot tested. 
in a chemistry lab for three years using his own funding. And there were irregularities and oddities with the ink that the chemists couldn't understand. I, I talk about this in an end upside down thinking, just one of the anecdotes. But there was something very powerful about hearing his voice and I'd heard other things. And I remember I just couldn't move in my chair when I heard that. And I started looking around the room, like, are there th beings that I can't see what's going on here? So there were events like that, where it was like the evidence I had heard, plus something that would tip me over the edge even more, where it was like an accelerated awakening. And I, when I took those bigger steps forward, it was harder and harder to come back and that's where I am now, six years later, where it's like, I've seen so much evidence in different places. I don't think I could really come back fully on this paradigm unless there were, I don't know. I don't know how all this stuff could be discounted. Right, right. I, I completely get that. And I, I completely appreciate that when new information comes, I, I watch my own mind. I watch my own mind with this today. I mean, not exactly today, but in these days we're living in, when something new comes at me, I, I, I'm kind of startled. I kind of go, wow. I look into it and then I kind of, this is just me. I kind of step back and I allow the distractions to pull me to what, wherever I was before. And, and then, but it's, but I'm still changed and it'll hit me again and I'll, I'll have to look at it again. But I, I watch my, I can watch myself be distracted because I'm outside my comfort zone now. It's like, I, I'm in this kind of new world, and it may be something, um, you know, like I just watched a five-hour video on 9-11 and all sorts of things that I didn't know about mm -hmm. uh, at the time or even in the last 20 years. And it's like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. I didn't know that at all. That means things could be very different. And then it's like, it's not like I go back to the old paradigm, but I get distracted into my life and, and put it aside. <laughs> Yes. So there's something about this awakening that is a for me continually coming back. It's and it's it's like a muscle I need to keep working on because I'm committed to awakening. So I got to come back to that thing that was so disturbing to me. I've got to come back to that thing that was so disturbing to me, and and then eventually that thing that was so disturbing to me becomes like my new paradigm. Mm -hmm. And then you know because my prayer is show me what I cannot yet see, I'm always shown something else, and then I go through that struggle again. Um, so the awakening process is tough. So, but I love the way you describe it because it isn't linear at all. Yes. And what, what I'd like to add to that is my process and maybe yours as well invo involves reconciliation. So I come across this new information, but then I have assumptions about life that are, seem to be pretty solid. And I have to reconcile these two things. How can the, they both be true in some capacity? So like with regard to consciousness, there's a lot of science that still is true. It's not erasing the entire old paradigm, but it's integrating new information and somehow rejiggering it. Uh, and that, so that's part of the intellectual process is how could both of these things be true at the same time? Or maybe in some cases, my assumptions are wrong and I have to redo other things. But it, this, this is an active process. Yeah, You have to be intellectually active. And if you have to want to do it, it's easy to get distracted. Like you say, even for people who want to do it, you get distracted with other things. And it's like, you have to pick up that thread um, and then well, I, I want, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, sometimes it's a, it's a, a case of, there's a polarity where both react, both ideas are true, but there's just some transcendent awakening that can see that they're both true. Other times one does supersede the other. I mean, I think yes. about the idea that, you know, the idea that the, um, the earth, the sun goes around the earth. And, you know, and now it's the earth goes around the sun, but that, right. that, like those two weren't polarities. One, one was actually a, a, a new way of looking at things that explained reality in a more accurate way. Yes. Sometimes they are mutually exclusive. So they are incompatible theories, but other times they can be integrated and there's an, or there's an aspect of a theory that can be applied to the new yeah. framework. Um, but it's, it takes a lot of mental energy to want to do that. Yeah. And it, it never sure ends. Does. That's yeah, what it seems it never like. Ends. And uh, what I also want to say quickly is that, especially my second book, An End Upside Down Living, I talk about the awakening journey and I study a lot of cases of people who have awakened, uh, both in contemporary times, but also historically. And there are lots of patterns. And there's this notion that the enlightenment process is a process of subtraction, meaning it's, it's getting rid of our assumptions and old paradigms and allowing something new to emerge. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, then then we allow that something new to emerge. It's, it's a bit counterintuitive, subtraction rather than addition in a way. 
Right. I got it. Okay. So let's talk about the upside down thinking that our world is living in or awakening to. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fundamental. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's fundamental. And what I'm about to describe is not where I started on the journey. I, I started with anomalies. So phenomena that seem to exist that did not match the paradigm I had for the nature of reality. But as I studied more and more, the anomaly started to congeal into a general theme and a general question, which is really what an end to upside down thinking is about, which is about whether or how the brain could create consciousness. So the brain is just a physical structure in our skull, but consciousness is this thing that people talk about a lot, but it's very difficult to define because we can't touch it. It's not a physical thing. I can, I can touch my body. I can touch the chair, but I can't touch consciousness. It's, an, it's a very abstract thing. And yet it is the part of us that has experience. It's our subjective inner awareness. So without consciousness, we wouldn't be able to even ask these questions or experience the physical world. And Therein lies what's known as the hard problem of consciousness, which is how is it that something physical like a brain could create something non-physical like consciousness? And I, I was shocked to learn that science doesn't know the answer to that question. And in fact, Science Magazine, a very mainstream, credible organization, uh, laid out its top 25 questions remaining in all of science. And number two on the list in the way they phrase it is, what is the biological basis of consciousness? So in the question, they're assuming that there is a biological basis of consciousness, that consciousness comes from biology. And they're just asking, well, how does that happen? What I say in the book, and this is the upside down thinking is, no, it's not the brain that produces consciousness, but consciousness comes first. And the brain is like a filtering mechanism. Some might call it a blindfold, a processor, an antenna receiver for consciousness. So to lay it out even further, more generally, there's a philosophy in science known as scientific materialism, sometimes called physicalism, which says, and this was my belief system, I didn't know at the time, but I was a physicalist, a materialist. It says 13.8 billion years ago, roughly, there was a big bang. We don't know how that happened, but grant us this one miracle and we'll explain everything else. That's the theory. So there was a big bang and it filled the universe with atoms of matter. So physical stuff all over the place. And then you have pieces of matter colliding with each other. We call that chemistry. So you have lots of chemical reactions in this big universe. And then randomly what happens in what Richard Dawkins, and he wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, and he's an evolutionary biologist. He calls it a primordial soup of stuff floating around. You end up with a self-replicating molecule like DNA. And then that leads to the evolution of life, like a human being, which develops a brain. And then poof, consciousness pops out of the brain. So we started with matter and then consciousness comes afterwards. That's the paradigm. And if you believe that, if you believe that the brain creates consciousness and that it comes from matter, then when the brain dies, there is no more consciousness. You also might believe that there are no such things as psychic abilities because consciousness is localized to the brain. It's just something that's stuck in your skull. It's not, it's not non-local. Um, it can't transcend space and time. Those are crazy ideas because it's just emerging from the brain. The paradigm that I suggest in the book, which many other people have suggested, is we don't have to throw out material science, physics, chemistry, and biology, or neuroscience. We just have to recontextualize consciousness and say consciousness comes first. Uh, Max Planck, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, he said in 1931, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative of consciousness. That is the key. That's what I'm talking about when I say upside down thinking. Um, and I'll pause there. Yeah, I just want yeah. to say that uh, just to bring in a little Bible, I don't know how you feel about that, but if, in, in the beginning was the word. It didn't say in the beginning was matter. And right. it's like the, the word, I think, is a representation of consciousness. That's how I see it. In the beginning, in the beginning was consciousness. I think the mystics have always kind of known this and science is catching up. But in, in, the, it, in the beginning was not a, a molecule, was not a block was not a man. In the beginning was this word. It was, and and I know it's just a writing, and but I, I think it's kind of accurately describes this paradigm. I agree. And what I another compelling piece of evidence for me was that if you look at spiritual traditions all over the world, 
the, the mystical sects of those traditions say the same thing that yeah. we are part of an interconnected field of consciousness. They might use different words to describe it. The analogy that I like to use comes from a philosopher, Dr. Bernardo Castrup, who says that all reality could be compared to a stream of water, an infinite stream where water represents consciousness. And each of us is like a whirlpool, a localization within the, the broader stream. So we feel like an individual. And at one level, we are an individual, but at another level, we're interconnected. These are age old traditional uh, thoughts that, I was wondering, like, how how could it be that they were saying the same thing, that now a lot of science and quantum physics is pointing to this, too? That was another data point that was powerful for me. Yes, yeah, sci science, I always say science is kind of catching up. But even if you're a spiritual person, and even if you know that consciousness precedes matter, it's still kind of... Um, a head thing we have with it like because we're living in a we're living in a world where the paradigm is materialism so like even though i know that consciousness precedes everything the world i'm living in is a materialistic world and it's 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 challenging for me to hold on to consciousness when everything looks separate and everything looks solid and everything you know so and and i'm, I'm stuck in i'm stuck in the paradigm because i was born in this paradigm yes this is it was my challenge and to some degree still is with with consciousness because it's not what i see it's not what i experience on a day-to-day -day basis and i can empathize with other people that are trying to go down this path and struggle with it because uh to me, this is, I, I call it in my second book, I think the, the meta paradox of life, meaning that this is the ultimate paradox, that at one level, we are one and interconnected and non-physical. And at the level of experience, some would call it the relative level of reality. There is a me and a you and an apparently physical world. And that is the reality in which we exist. And we can't deny that, but we don't throw out the other more abstract part of reality too. They coexist, even though they appear to be paradox, they appear to be contradictory. It's this right. paradox we have to hold. Right. But if, if I, because I'm around a lot of people who are spiritually oriented and, and, and get all this, but they're afraid of death. <laughs> so mm. it's like, and I think that yeah. afraid, fear of death is part of this materialist philosophy. It's like, because the materialist philosophy would say you end when you die. Even if we know we don't end when we die, if, if we actually really embrace this, we would not fear death. Do you think? Well, that's been my own experience. Yeah. Is that I don't look, I, it's not that I want to die, right. but I don't think it's this just blackness and end. Um, I, I view life as an evolutionary process at the level of our consciousness. So I think life is much more meaningful and I want to evolve as much as I can in this life because I think the consciousness individuated soul uh, continues afterwards. So um, I think there is a, a biological natural fear that does emerge though, where, where safety takes over and we want to protect ourselves. And I think that's a good thing because I view the body as a vessel to serve and do all sorts of things. So it's not like we would just want to die with this perspective, but the fear is not what it used to be. It's, 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 I wouldn't say that I fear it per se. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, um, this, this shift, <laughs> this shift yeah. in the upside down thinking and um, I think just for, for everyone who's listening, where, how materialism shows up regularly today and what this consciousness precedes the brain, what that means for people today. How does it practically translate for everyone today? Hmm. To me, the biggest uh, paradigm shift in terms of practical thinking is the notion of identity that's implied by the paradigm shift. So I used to think my identity is mark this biological body. That's my identity. And that identity happens to have a consciousness that experiences the world. And now I view identity as the reverse, is that my identity is consciousness that is experiencing this world that appears to be physical through the vehicle of a body. That's a, that's a game changer because then you walk around in daily life looking at things very differently. And then it allows me to look at other people differently too, that they are a consciousness inhabiting a body suit and going through ups and downs and challenges and evolving in different ways. That's part of their spiritual experience ultimately. Yeah, and I would think other beings and trees and flowers and air and everything, you know. Yes. I, I, the, so um, 
what, what I want to ask is, I mean, I see all this and I think that we're talking about this. And again, I think a lot of people believe this, understand this, but they don't live it. Like they're not embodying it. You know, it's like, I understand that I'm consciousness, but that guy over there really pisses me off <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and or, or that political party or all the divisions. There's so many, it, it almost makes me think I'm, I'm diverging now, but, but if we are all one, we are all connected and there's so much going on to try to divide, 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 get this group mad at you, get this group mad at each other and political divides and racial divides and age divides and philosophical divides and sexual orientation divides. And it, it almost seems like there's somebody out there <laughs> that doesn't want us to, to really grasp this, this new way of thinking. Um, yeah. So that, that's one idea I have. And the other is, how do you make the shift from understanding this and knowing this to actually living it? Do you remember that? Yes. So let me start with your first point and then okay. move to living it. So your first point, because my thinking on this has evolved, uh, like how could it be if what we're talking about is true, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience ultimately? If that's true, and most of society today is walking around not thinking, even thinking about that, let alone believing it to be true, how, what's going on? And initially in my book, An End Upside Down Thinking, I talk about some of the suppression of science. Uh, so there does seem to be active suppression, but sometimes it's the ego of the scientists. Yeah. Um, and there, people are resistant to paradigm shifts. There's psychological mechanisms for this too. But what you're asking and what I've been asking more recently as well is, um, is there a deeper, a deeper control system that wants to suppress this understanding? And uh, on a spiritual level, that makes a lot of sense to me because if you believe that we exist for the purpose of evolution, then the notion of good and evil is just another way of describing evolution. Something that's evil is a way for us to look at darkness and evolve past it. It's like a challenge for the soul to grow. So maybe that's what's happening. On one level, it's totally evil because it's suppressing people's spirituality, but another level, it's allowing us to go from the state of pure amnesia to to re-realizing what we are and realizing the truth and seeing whether or not we can do that. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, it's like you point out all these differences so that we can go, you know what? None of that's true. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you and know, learn like, it. Yeah, and learn it. It's like, I, I, I couldn't see how that's not true before until I saw all of the differences. Like I couldn't see the oneness was true until I saw all the differences and how that wasn't true. Yes, exactly. You're reminding me now of a quote from uh, the poet Wallace Stevens, who said, death is the mother of beauty. So oh, we, we sometimes that. we need the darkness in order to see the beauty and the light. You need the contrast. Yeah. And that that to me explains a lot. But it, at the same time, doesn't mean that we should just ignore evil and say, oh, it's just evil doing its thing. I think there's also a responsibility. I think a karmic responsibility to try to transcend it and help other people transcend it. Yeah, and there's another quote in your book. I wish I had it right in front of me. I think it was Max Planck, but it had something to do with, oh, it had something to do with um, like new new ways of thinking. Don't don't happen because you convince people. They happen because the old way dies. People die. <laughs> do you right. remember that quote? <laughs> it progresses through funerals. People have yeah. paraphrased it. Science progresses through funerals or something yes, like yes. that. Yes, yes. I, yeah. I, I've I've always maintained that death has a real purpose for evolution. I mean, not, not just, you know, for the souls recycling or whatever, but if we didn't have death, we would never have new, new ways of thinking really, really taking hold. I mean, they would be fringe thinking new ways or acting new ways, but to take hold as a new world view, it really requires there kind of being a, a, a turnover of, of people, I think, or, or minds. Yes. Yeah. Turnover of people and power structures. Yeah. But then yes. this gets to your second question, transitioning into how do we live it and experience it? Mm -hmm. I think the movement is ultimately going to be and seems to be grassroots because the media is so controlled. The messaging is controlled. It's hard to get some of this alternative stuff through on a mass scale. So it's at the level of the individual or each individual is having these realizations. And for me, it was largely an intellectual process to start and still very much is, but then it starts to become more experiential, like synchronicities happen and energy during meditation. And I've had some of that as well. Um, but it brings me to what I wanted to say about, about living it and experiencing it. 
what I've found is that people have the biggest shifts and the most radical and the, the fastest shifts when it is a lived experience. So for some people, it might be in meditation. They have a spontaneous feeling of oneness. Um, sometimes people with a certain psychedelic, they might experience it in another dimension or near-death experiences. They're in cardiac arrest. Their brain was off. They were clinically dead and they come back in their body and they describe this, all this amazing stuff that happened to them when they shouldn't have been able to have a lucid consciousness. And they say, well, I don't care what the scientists say. This was real. I experienced it. I'm going to change my job. Sometimes they get divorced because their life priorities change so much and it can be overnight. Um, and so that's one category, this lived experience. And then there's the more gradual path, which has been mine. It sounds like yours to some degree mm -hmm. might have been that. Um, where it's this like back and forth based on evidence and then maybe lived experiences come in and there's a gradual process. Yeah, I I, I think about lived experiences. I um, When was it? I think it was 2018. It, it doesn't matter. There's a, a solar eclipse. My youngest daughter and I traveled to North Carolina for a solar eclipse and we were in this little town and we were with you know hundreds of people. It was a small town. And everybody had the little gla glasses on, all that kind of stuff. But it was so interesting when the full, it was a place where the, the eclipse was full. When the full eclipse occurred, everybody went quiet. And there was such a feeling. I mean, it was just like, we were all one. I could just feel it. It was hard to describe, but I, I, I don't feel that way at a football game or, you know, or at the zoo or at, you know, the doctor's office. but. At, in this moment, I think because all of us were so focused on having this experience that we had this individual experience, we had this collective experience, and it just really felt like we were really embodying this, we are all one. And it, I just wanted, that's just one of the touchstones that I would have where it's like, okay, that was a lived experience, mm -hmm. it's a lived experience that what I, I intellectually believe I experienced in that that time. And I also have that experience when I do, if I do um, a particular embodiment meditation or something where, where it's not just sitting and meditating, but I actually get my soul back in my body. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm walking amongst nature, everything is just so different. It just feels so, I'm very connected to the trees and the wind and the bugs and whatever, my dog. And and it, it lasts as long as it lasts, maybe 30 minutes. And I think I've held it for like two and a half hours is the longest wow. <laughs> I've held it. <laughs> but then you go back to life. <laughs> right, right. Because we have to live too. So the question is, how do, we, right. how do we hold that? There's an analogy in the yogic tradition of how this works. And they talk about dipping a white cloth into red dye. And you dip it in the dye and then you take it out and let it sit in the sun. And then it becomes a pinkish color because the sun dries it out. And then you dip it back in the dye and then you let it dry out. And it's a little bit darker because it had the residue from the previous one. And when you keep dipping it in over and over again, the residue is stronger on that cloth. And the dipping process oh. is like spiritual practice. And I talk about this more in my second book and end upside down living Four categories that have been really helpful to me for how to try to embody it. And they're based roughly off of the yogic tradition. I've combined a few things, but it applies to any spiritual tradition. And the four pathways are uh, the wisdom, knowledge, so learning things, devotion, so that is love for the divine, uh, gratitude, prayer, dancing, things like that, um, selfless service, and energy practices broadly, which could be breathing, meditation, qigong. That's a huge category of things. Yeah. So what, what the traditions say is that usually people start off with one, that's their anchor. And then as you move forward with one, the others start naturally to come into play. So let's take my journey as an example. Started on the knowledge path very clearly, but as I learn more about the interconnected nature of reality, then wow, service makes a lot more sense since we're all interconnected. And wow, I should really have gratitude in my life much more. And I should th be thinking about things like prayer and just expressing gratitude. And I should be doing things like meditation and other things. So they all start to come together naturally, depending on where you start. And going back to the cloth analogy, as those spiritual practices are done more and more, then it becomes a natural state for a person. And I'll just say one more thing before pausing. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Rick Archer, who hosts a show called Buddha at the Gas Pump on ordinary people who have spiritual awakenings, which was, I learned a lot from my second book on that show. He says that um, spiritual awakening is an accident, meaning having some blowout experience of unity. It's an accident, but spiritual practice can make you accident prone. 
Oh, nice. Nice. I love that. That's great. I also love these four um, aspects, wisdom, devotion, selfless service, and energy practices. Because I do think that uh, spiritual generators tend to pick one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they tend to pick, um, you know, meditation or and, and that's their soul practice. And I've had guests on who are really in, do the devotion and it's fa fantastic. You, you talk to these people who they're, they're doing this sacred dance and trying mm -hmm. to show people how to experience the divine through sacred dance or, um, or, you know, or, or the people who are in service. But so do you think that it, it really takes all four? Like, it's almost like, like we need to do all four. I think that for each person, it's different. The more okay. I look at this, each person has a different recipe, but I think that as one advances in any of those four categories, it is naturally the case that others will emerge and maybe the proportions will differ for each person. So maybe I will never be as devotional as some of the people you're describing, but I will be more devotional at some point in the future than I am now. But maybe like my, the wisdom part is going to be where I'm going to be really excelling. I don't know yeah. how it works. Um, and then I, I want to add to this because ultimately I think what you're asking about is how do we develop as a, as a human, as a spiritual being in a human body. And there's a big focus in the spiritual community on awakening, however one wants to define that. And those four categories really all relate to awakening. Um, Ken Wilber, the spiritual philosopher, talks about various lines of development, which he says are relatively independent of one another. And to summarize the way he just, he combines categories, he says, it's about waking up, cleaning up, and growing up. So, so far we've talked a lot about waking up, but to really be a complete person, to embody everything, it's not just the waking up part and doing those four things. There's a cleaning up process and looking at our own inner trauma and wanting to look at our own inner darkness and societal darkness and wanting to transcend it. And there's all kinds of pr uh, practices that people can do. It could even be psychotherapy. It could be lots of different things, hypnosis, to try to clear one's trauma or, or get rid of that darkness rather than engage in spiritual bypass and say, I don't want to look mm -hmm. at the darkness. And then it comes up to bite us individually or collectively. And then to me, I'm, I've been really focused on this, uh, the growing up because so growing up broadly defined is, I think, maturation, a willingness to accept reality for what it is, not just what we, what we want it to be, understanding the reality of evil and not ignoring it, um, taking personal responsibility rather than going for victimhood. Those sorts of things are related to growing up. And maybe even just acknowledging how the world works practically in this realm and not thinking that we're only a spiritual being. We are a spiritual being, but we're also in the world. So waking up, cleaning up, and growing up. And what happens often is there can be an imbalance, especially in the spiritual community, focusing on, I want to have that blowout spiritual experience. I want to be living in bliss all the time because there are maybe some people that are like that. Uh, but it's, I think to be a complete human, it's all these other things in one. It's, it's the waking up, cleaning up, and growing up. And the, the problem that emerges is when the imbalance occurs, a person could have a great fall so in my second book, I talk about spiritual teachers and some of the dangers where you could have a guru who is incredibly spiritually awakened, but maybe hasn't done some of the work in the other areas and is imbalanced. And then the person is susceptible to things. So Mariana Kaplan, who's looked at spiritual teachers, she, she says the three categories where people usually fall is money, sex, and power. They grip people. <laughs> It's it's shocking. I don't know. I'm still shocked by that. But every time I see some amazing spiritual person that that's re that's revealed about them that some they had some major trip there it's like really <laughs> but yeah I, it is that that spiritual bypass it's big and i can see that i can even see the topics that i cover on my podcast that people like the wake up stuff but when i do the the clean up and the grow up stuff it's it's not as interesting to people it's it's some it's a i, I had this conversation recently with with people at a, a memorial service i i led on Sunday, it was afterwards, but somebody posed the question, you know, that don't you think you could be harming people by, by showing them what reality is that, <laughs> that, that, that they could, they could then take that and do something horrible. You know, they could, they, they're, maybe they're not emotionally stable and they're not willing to accept it, which is true. But I do find that most people who aren't willing to look at it don't see it when you even bring it up. I mean, you can put it in their face and they won't mm -hmm. see it because they're just not seeing it. But it is very important to accept reality for what it is. And I think that's the hardest thing for people. 
Yes. And along one of the problems that I'm seeing emerge, because I'm really trying to reconcile this myself of how can this person that I respect so much spiritually totally miss this other thing? It, there's oh, yeah. this, it, I don't, I'm trying to reconcile it. And maybe part of it crosses multiple categories, which is around discernment. Maybe that's more around growing up. I don't know. But discernment is a big one because you could see something and an event in the world or even a person and see the goodness and overlook the darkness and then out of one's own compassion and positive intent support something that's actually really evil and not see it so it's like this weaponization of compassion that comes oh, about yes that's happening a yeah. lot yes it's and a you and one. I, yeah, you and I know how it's happening. And, and I don't know if people who are listening know <laughs> the same things. <laughs> and I'm not saying I know everything. There's an awful yeah. lot I don't see. I know that. I know there's an awful lot I don't see. But, but I do believe compassion and good naturedness is being weaponized. Yes. And, and a lot in the spiritual community because there's such a focus on compassion. And in my second book, so I, I talk about 10 approaches for living life based on this spiritual idea. And even back then, before I had looked at a lot of the darker stuff from my other books, I, I, I mentioned compassion as one of the 10, but I called it compassion with discernment. And the context that I use there is I'd come across cases of people in their spiritual awakening journeys where they were just immersed with unconditional love. They were literally feeling it all the time. So they were letting people into their life. They're saying, oh, I'm so loving. And a, one woman I, I quote in the book, she literally let a man into her home for months. And she said it was hell because she was so loving. And this man manipulated mm -hmm. her. And she said, I couldn't discern. So there is, it's this balanced approach that to me is the more complete spiritual human. I'm still trying to figure it out, but there's something, it's not just the waking up. That's critical, but that's not the only piece. Yeah. In unity, it's one of my ordinations. The, there's a teaching called the 12 powers and that we each have 12 divine gifts. And of course, love is one um, and discernment is one. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like one, any of these gifts are there, you know, it's like l love, discernment, imagination, power, uh, strength. There's a, there's a bunch of order, uh, understanding, will. There's a bunch of them. But the idea is that none of them, not one of them is better or stronger than the other. You don't want to have one, not the other, but we want mm -hmm. to have balance them all. Like they are all spiritual gifts. These are like God ideas within us or God constructs within us, gifts, energies, powers. And, but if we get imbalanced, that, that, that takes us way off in the wrong direction. And I, and I think that's what you're talking about. You can be in balance with this idea. Your love can be imbalanced because love is, is a continuum and you if you completely love another at the exclusion of yourself you're not honoring the power of love you know you're just <laughs> you're just screwing yourself over thinking that you're loving somebody but it's you're you're not honoring love itself you're not being love itself you're out of balance discernment is a big 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 one and i think my last podcast we talked about guess we talked about this that this is i think the gift that we all need to hone in this lifetime <laughs> in yeah. a big 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 way to discern truth from falsehood, um, upside down from <laughs> up and down, yeah. and um, you know God from not God, the voice of guidance that is divine, and the voice that is not divine. That all of these things, and I really think that they're really showing up in a big way in our world right now, so we can hone our discernment and make the right choices. Yes, very well said, and I'm appreciating that more and more in my own journey. Because I did start on this waking up journey and I didn't care about the world at all. I mean, even before I started on my journey spiritually, I was focused on my job. I didn't care about the political, the, I didn't follow the news very much, other unless it related to my work. So I had this laser focus. And then when I got into spiritual stuff, I'm like, oh, we're just, we're spiritual beings. Um, and then in my later books, looking at what's happening in the world, I realized, wow, this discernment piece is not so obvious just from learning about waking up. It's, it's a somewhat distinct skill and the application of the spiritual principles is not always obvious. That's another thing I've been grappling with because you could have a lot of people who have the same spiritual metaphysics, basically. We're all one, we're moving towards unconditional love, we should be compassionate, uh, all that stuff. And we could agree completely. And then we'll completely disagree on what's happening in the world. We'll see something on the news and one person will see this, another person will see that. And I'm thinking to myself, how is this, how is this possible? 
and I think often people are, are, are applying spirituality differently. And I'll give one example. It was related to kind of what you're describing before. Um, like the notion of individuality versus a, a collective that we're all interconnected. Sometimes there's the denial of the individual in the spiritual world and the denial of having a boundary and, and saying no to things. Uh, like that's, that's actually essential because we have to accept reality that we are an individual and we have to protect the individual because we're part of the collective too. Like serving the collective doesn't mean ignoring yourself. Ignoring mm -hmm. yourself, I think, is, is counter to spiritual ideas. And those nuances sometimes get lost. Yeah. And taking care of your body uh, versus everybody else's body. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. It's not selfish to do that. It's actually, there, it's, it's spiritual to want to take care of yourself so that you can then therefore be of more service. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say something controversial and then we can cut it if it's too controversial. <laughs> okay. But I'm thinking about the vaccination um, topic where people are saying that all those people aren't getting vaccinated or selfish. And I'm seeing this kind of a projection because it's like the person who's saying that is wanting to make a demand on another to do something to their body in order for me to feel comfortable. So where is the selfishness? Is it in the person who's choosing for their own body, for their own reasons, their own body, to not put something in their body, uh, whether it's food, medicine, an injection, and they're choosing that for themselves. And then others are offended by that. Like you need to care about everybody, so you need to do that. And it seems to me that what's going on there is to demand for somebody to do something in order you feel comfortable that the selfishness is lies there. Right. And another way to describe that phenomenon, which I've been thinking about myself too, is uh, a misapplication or let's say an unequal application of compassion. It's like, I'm selectively going to be compassionate. I'm going to be compassionate in this circumstance, but I'm going to ignore the way in which I'm actually not being compassionate to this group of people. Right. It, it's, it's not consistent. It's not uniform compassion. Well, right, right. And I don't know where you lie on this and we don't have to go into it, okay. but it certainly is that way with animals, you know, that we're compassionate towards our family, our humans, family, or those who we consider worthy of our compassion. But but animals are things and commodities that we can do whatever the hell we want to with them. That that's that's selective compassion as well. Right. Yeah. There's certainly mistreatment of humans and animals and other beings. And it's yeah. It's all connected. That's an issue. Um, so one thing I want to I want to make sure that my listeners get is what this Newtonian materialist view really is, because we are immersed in it, and I don't know that we can really mm. see it because we're immersed in it. So can you describe a few of the ways that we're living in this Newtonian materialist view? Uh, you did talk about the idea that the brain doesn't create consciousness, but consciousness creates the brain. But there's so many ways that we live in this. I mean, mm -hmm. so many ways. So for somebody who can't see, they say like the the, the fish can't see the water he's swimming in. <laughs> yeah. How would we point out to people what this water, this Newtonian materialistic view is? Okay. Well, it's typically associated with the analogy of billiard balls that all reality is just a bunch of things bumping into each other. And there's a linear progression of when you, this bumps into another thing, then this happens in X, Y, and Z. And it ignores the unseen and it ignores um, things that are non-linear. So it gets into the realm of like quantum physics and to just very simply describe some of the phenomena, which challenge Newtonian materialistic ideas, the idea of entanglement, which has been shown in quantum physics. Albert Einstein tried to disprove uh, entanglement because he, he he thought that the speed of light was the fastest that anything could travel. And entanglement was suggesting that two particles that are separate from each other have a connection that you can't see with the eye, where if you affect one particle, the other particle is affected at the exact same instant, which suggests that something is happening beyond the speed of light and there's an interconnectivity. Newtonian physics would say that does like, come on, that, that doesn't make sense because um, it's beyond the, the linear mind. That's one, one of the key phenomena. Another one in the quantum realm is um, it's, it's called the double slit laser experiment, just, but to simplify it, it's that when people observe the experiment, then the experiment itself changes. The particle starts to behave differently when there's an observer. And there are lots of different theories on why this is the case, but it, many have theorized that when consciousness is introduced into a system, 
that it actually changes the system itself. So there's no physical contact like you would expect with billiard balls. You have to have one billiard bar touching the other to move it. Wait, if consciousness is impacting the system, it's something that's non-physical that's involved. And that changes so much, including every scientific experiment. Um, there's a phenomenon I talk about in the book known as psychokinesis, mind impacting what we call matter, if you even if matter is even a real thing. But mm -hmm. there are studies statistically that show even an ordinary person can have a very small but highly statistically significant effect. Uh, for example, on a on a machine called a random number generator, a machine that generates zeros and ones in a random fashion. And when you look over time, there's 50% ones, 50% zeros. And they might take a person, they did this at Princeton University and elsewhere, and they'd ask the person to try to mentally influence the machine to make it produce more ones than zeros. And what they find is that when you do many trials of this, that that there is a, a non-random effect, that it's slightly more than 50% um, when the person puts their attention to it. And it's a small effect, but it's statistically a significant thing. This counters so much of the Newtonian world. Now, some of the broader implications of challenging Newtonian ideals is the idea of something that transcends the body. Because if the brain just creates consciousness, then when you die, that's the end of consciousness. There could be no afterlife. There could be no reincarnation. And when you look at it in a different way, the, all those things are possible. So the notion of, of meaning built into the nature of reality becomes possible when we, we don't throw out Newtonian physics, but when we expand the paradigm. Yeah. And you also talk in your book how this science that arises about this, um, the unseen, mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's, it's censored or that the, the, the scientific world doesn't want to hear it. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, yeah. I, so you mentioned I'm on the board of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which yes. is one of the uh, independent organizations that is able to study these phenomena like psychokinesis, like energy healing, telepathy, amazing stuff. Uh, lucid dreaming, because at mainstream academic organizations, you can't do that or you will be shunned. Um, so to give an example, one scientist uh, was told at a mainstream academic institution, well known, to take her psychic research off her resume if she wanted to get tenure. Um, I'll give another example. Uh, I hear this all the time. Scientific journals will reject papers that talk about psychic phenomena or these other paranormal type things on the basis of the subject matter. Without looking at the study at all, they'll say, no, we're just not even touching this because it's paranormal. Um, another example that I learned about since writing the first book that really struck me, this was on an episode of a podcast called, called Skeptico. Uh, Dr. Mario Beauregard, who is a neuroscientist in this area, uh, looking at the paranormal, looking at consciousness beyond the brain. And at one of the organizations he's with in Canada, he was told by the person responsible for, sounds like a big shot in the organization who basically sets the curriculum. Uh, this person said to him, as long as I'm alive, you will never study these phenomena here. Yeah, so this is so important. When people say trust the science, <laughs> it's very important to know that science is kind of like the television. It's like what is presented to you is presented to you as science, but there's all this other stuff that's not being allowed to come to the surface. Exactly. Yeah. And there, there's this assumption because I've been trying to deconstruct the psychology of like trying to understand how the world is the way it is because we have such yeah. differing opinions and people will say, well, that that couldn't be true because it wasn't on the news and the people right. on the news are trustworthy and there's no way that they wouldn't cover the story. And I know a lot of very intelligent people who will make that kind of argument, even with my first book of like, Mark, yeah, there's a lot of science you're pointing to, but there are really smart professors who disagree and they say it's not true. And a lot of other people say it's not true, so I'm not even going to bother with this. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I think the thing is, is that's the way new ideas have always been treated. And so it's really important to know when, when something is being squelched, that some something that is we know is happening, but it's being squelched, it's really just this struggle that we have with evolving our consciousness it's like this discomfort that some majority has that wants to keep it under the lid so that that they i think you point this out in your book too they they don't have to say that they were wrong mm -hmm. there's something in the human psyche that just cannot say i was wrong and or i was fooled those are the yeah. two things that i see going on that that is so strong like people will 
I mean, they'll, they'll hold on to that conviction, even if it kills hundreds of thousands of people, they're going to yeah. hold on to that conviction. Or even if it keeps hundreds of thousands of millions or billions of people confined or um, not free or um, just kept down in our evolution, I guess that's a better word for it, because I can't admit that I was wrong. It just, and, and I, don't, I don't even think that reflection even happens. It's just, I'm not going there. Yeah. And, and it, so it takes so much energy for these new science to come up or these new ideas, these new paradigms to come up and constantly being bad at it. It's like whack-a-mole, you know, it comes up, yeah. bam, comes up, bam. And you just gotta keep at it. And until eventually there's enough of us that are living this, and then it starts to just kind of be a little bit more normalized. And then something else will come up and we'll be the ones going, no. <laughs> yes. I, I have also seen this to a smaller degree in my, in my own life. So writing books, talking about these topics, I always have to check myself because I don't know. I mean, I, I actually don't claim that I'm right necessarily about anything. I think I, I ascribe probabilities to certain things because I don't know anything for sure, but there's right. certainly things that I'm promoting and I'm writing about them. And I'm saying them in a strong way. And I have to check myself and be willing to acknowledge maybe new evidence will come along and I'll have to revise these theories or I'll have to admit that I wrote something that now I don't agree with or something like that. And I have to be willing to do that. Yes. Um, but I can understand how that would be difficult for someone, especially let's say you've spent your whole career, you got a PhD in the topic, you are the world's leading expert on this one thing. You're not going to have an incentive to explore the alternatives. And I do quote someone in the book about this saying, who said he basically rationalized how he doesn't look at all this stuff because he's like, look, um, there are other things that are more important for me to focus on. And the odds that these things are true, these paranormal phenomena are so small that it's not even worth my time to spend, to look at them. So you can start to rationalize right. why you shouldn't. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe you surround yourself with people who only believe a certain thing, and then it becomes even more difficult to transcend it. Yeah. It's amazing that humans evolve at all. Um, I think the other thing is where the money is, right? I mean, the money is not going to this paranormal research. That's huge because yeah. in order to do the studies properly, you need lots of replications. And the irony of, of this area of study, some call it parapsychology or PSI, PSI, paranormal psychology, even though I don't like the term paranormal because it's, yeah. all this stuff is normal if you have a different paradigm. Right. Um, I, but I, any, I don't like that term either. I say it because people know what I'm talking about, but I don't, I don't agree with the term. Um, but what I see in this space is that the scientists have been so maligned that they're even more careful with their studies because they know they're going to get battered when they come out with a finding that's extraordinary to people. They actually, in some ways, are more careful, uh, but that requires a lot of funding and you need people that are open-minded to be able to fund it. I mean, getting government grants or mainstream organizations to fund this stuff, they're not going to want to do it because there's reputational risk. And mm -hmm. looking on, and I talk about this a bit more in my later books, but it's relevant here, go on Wikipedia, like Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, an example I point to often, Cambridge biochemist. He studied psychic phenomena on animals and other amazing things, telephone telepathy. Go to his Wikipedia page, and it says that he's a pseudoscientist. And his his Wikipedia page, at least the last time I checked semi-recently, was that it's it's partially locked, so you can't even edit it. I've seen that before. I that's when I, when I started noticing that, that's when I stopped donating to Wikipedia. Because I used <laughs> to donate to Wikipedia because I used it regularly to put my sermons together back when I was doing a church. So I felt like I should, you know, give back to where I get some information. But then when I started looking at people who were being um, false information about them and their, and their page was locked, <laughs> that's when I'm like, I'm out of Wikipedia. I can't, yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. So I, I'm thinking that, that our divine nature is so amazing. We, are, we have so much power. We are so unaware of the power of the self, the power of our divine self. And I, I think it's threatening to the power structures. And so there's not a lot of encouragement for us to awaken to our divine potential. Because if we were living in our divine potential, and I think we'll talk about this in our next time we talk about upside yeah. down liberty, if we were awake to that, we wouldn't need all the control systems. We wouldn't need so much of the structure of the world we live in. We wouldn't depend on all these corporations and structures. We wouldn't need all that because we we could generate it ourselves. So I do think there's kind of a, a clamping, tamping down on the potential of our divine nature. And I want to coin a new term. 
I want to call it trans normal. Okay. I like that. <laughs> like, like we're uh, tra transforming or we're, we're making a, a transformation <laughs> yeah. from the normal to the new normal. <laughs> That's a new one for me. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to give you the last word. So whatever else you want to share with us today. I'll okay. Well, as, you as you're talking about this, uh, this notion of a control system and what appears to be a suppression of truth, but more specifically as what we're talking about is a suppression of spirituality. And we're skipping ahead because I talk about this in the later books, but it's important. Um, I started to look back at ancient scriptures to see what they say, because maybe some of these scriptures aren't fiction. Like I used to think maybe they're describing history in some way. Maybe it's metaphor. Sometimes maybe these are actual events or metaphorically getting across a very important idea. And there are scriptures uh, called the Nag Hammadi texts. Are you familiar yes. with them? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the story here, and this was mind blowing to me when I learned about them, uh, they were uncovered in 1945 by farmers that were looking for manure in the ground. And they found these scrolls, uh, the, the bound books, these, these were bound books they found that were written in the second, third, fourth century AD. And the researchers theorize that these were such heretical teachings that they had to be buried because traditional Christianity did not allow them. They didn't want the teachings to be taught. So immediately I became very interested when I heard that. I wanted to learn what, what's in these. So I started reading some of the, the scriptures and there are different stories or different gospels in them. And uh, one of the stories I often reference um, I believe it's the secret gospel of John. That's the name of it. But there's another one that's called on the origin of the world and another called the nature of the rulers that have similar themes. And it talks about an origin story of how humanity got here. And the story, which I'll briefly summarize is there was just oneness. There was one. And I'm like, okay, that, that aligns with my metaphysics. And then there were individuations that spawned from that, these luminaries. And one of the luminaries spawned a being called Sophia. And Sophia was this divine being who had essentially a rogue son. So spawned this being who then created uh, the world that the humans now inhabit. So it comes from this rogue being, but it's still connected to the one effectively. And the idea, going back to what you're saying, is that humans have the divine spark within them because they ultimately come from this Sophia creature uh, or being. But her rogue son, Yaldabaoth is the name in one of the scriptures, created this world to suppress humanity's divine nature and wanted to keep nature from them. And one of the quotes in the scriptures, I'm going to paraphrase it, um, the rulers kept humanity in a state of confusion and toil so that they would be uh, distracted with the things of the world and not have the time to focus on the Holy Spirit. And that to me just summarizes, I'm like, wow, that is our world. That's our world. <laughs> that's our world. That's, that's a great story. I've never heard that story. Very interesting. I'd love to talk to you more about that story and also talk about the creation story that's in Genesis, because there's also kind of a restart in that one. Um, but very, very interesting. That rogue son. Yes. All right. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for being on today. And I really look forward to you coming back on and talking about the Upside Down Liberty. I feel, again, like so much is upside down in our world. I didn't even talk about that. I, I wonder sometimes if instead of germs causing illness, the illness causes germs. I, I wonder what the cause and effect. I think we had cause and effect messed up in a lot of things and just being open to asking those questions, mm. open to asking those questions about what is reality, why do I believe this? Where did this come from? What is meaning? Uh, what is existence? Maybe I'm wrong. I love that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's truth in this. These are all the questions that can help us evolve. Yes. I want to say something to, to add on to that. One of my favorite spiritual teachers is Dr. David Hawkins, who was a psychiatrist, and then he had his spiritual awakenings. He passed away about a decade ago. But one of his core teachings was transcending the notion of causality. Uh, of linear causality. He says, you have to drop that, that any, that this is causing that because really what we perceive as causation or even sequence is our interpretation through the human lens. We basically do a bunch of math and calculation in our mind and say, oh, it was this that caused this and this came before this and that's how time works. But that's from our limited lens and from a higher perspective, it's just emergence. I see so that. It, it's, an, I think, an important spiritual teaching to drop that assumption of what we think is causing what, because really we're seeing it through a little lens. And if you had a 
the 3,000, 30,000 foot view from the helicopter, you'd see maybe actually there's a different chain of events that is, seems to be causing something. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to hold back, but I'd love to get <laughs> go on and talk about the law of cause and effect and whether that, whether that is, is a spiritual law. But I think that's a really good point. We definitely can't see it all. So yeah. who, who knows? All right. Well, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate uh, your, your being on today and sharing what you know. And your book is fabulous, Into Upside Down Thinking. And we'll have you on in a couple months or so to talk about Into Upside Down Liberty. Thank all you right. so much for having me. And thanks for all the great work that you do. Oh, it is wonderful. And I now close the Spiritual Forum. Thank you, listeners.